good, good evening, everyone. Uh, and good evening, uh, dear Professor Yola Solanke. Welcome to the Hertie School. Uh, dear distinguished panelists, dear colleagues, uh, guests who are also joining us um, online uh, today as well as on-site. My name is Başak Çalı and uh, I'm Professor of International Law at the Hertie School and I'm one of the co-directors of the Center for Fundamental Rights together with uh, Professor Catherine um, Costello. And it's really my pleasure to deliver uh, these opening remarks uh, for this event. This is the distinguished lecture of Professor Solanke organized jointly by the Center for Fundamental Rights and uh, Jacques Delors Center, and is also part of the Civica Research Excellence Tour. So we, we also thank Civica for, for supporting this. So we are holding this lecture in a, in a room uh, which is called the Hendrik, Hendrik Enderline Forum uh, at the Harty School. And uh, this is a lecture hall that was dedicated to our late professor, um, Hendrik Enderline, who was one of the founders of Jacques Delors Center, and he also played a very significant role in the establishment of the Center for Fundamental Rights in 2020 as one of the centers of excellence um, at the Heritage School. So I just want to remember his memory and just let you know, our guests, uh, that um, you know, we, we honor his memory uh, in this lecture hall. So the title of uh, Professor Solanke's distinguished lecture this evening is Centering Black Women in EU Anti-Discrimination Law. This lecture brings together two research, teaching, and actually policy areas that are of great interest uh, to the Harty School, uh, located at the heart of Berlin. And of course, these are uh, the study of the challenges to the protection of fundamental rights in law and governance, and also the study of the European Union <laughs> as a key actor for protecting uh, fundamental rights as, a, as an institution. Um, so I'm really honored and I'm really thankful for Professor Solanke to actually bring these two massive interests, these major interests, together in her distinguished lecture uh, this evening. Um, I'm also just recently found out that um, uh, Professor Solanke was one of the first inaugural Hertie Fellows <laughs> 20 years from now, which I did not know uh, before we just had a little chat. So it's wonderful to actually have her come back to the uh, Hertie School. So uh, she was here uh, just when the school was established and she was one of the first fellows who spent some time in Berlin and actually worked uh, and contributed to discussions about the European Union and its study in Berlin uh, at the time. So welcome back, as well as welcome. Um, I'm also really personally thankful uh, for this lecture uh, because Professor Solanke uh, is inviting us uh, to systematically and critically examine how the European Union uh, is contributing to um, anti-discrimination and equality. And she's also doing it by centering uh, her, her discussion uh, in, from the lands of black uh, women workers. And I think this is a very important invitation uh, because she's asking us, uh, or she's inviting us, two sets of questions. One is to understand what EU is, is doing in this field. And I think the second is how we could ensure that the EU fares better. And I think uh, it comes from uh, the, the abstract as well. Uh, that the EU is not uh, faring uh, very well on that front. And I'm really looking forward to her lecture now and also the panel discussion that will follow. So now let me invite Catherine, Professor Catherine Costello, to uh, introduce uh, our uh, speaker and also our panelists. Um, and, um, and then we will, we will start with the lecture itself. Over to you, Catherine, and thank you. Thank you very much, Bashak. So it's a great honor to introduce not only our distinguished lecturer this evening, but our uh, three very distinguished commentators. Professor Iniola Solanke is a distinguished scholar, as Bashak mentioned, of both EU and discrimination law. She's written several books, including Making Anti-Discrimination Law and her groundbreaking Discrimination as Stigma, a Theory of Anti-Discrimination Law. Hers is a singular voice among scholars of anti-discrimination and EU law. Amongst her many articles is her, 2004, uh, her 2005 publication, Where Are the Black Lawyers in Germany? One of her many reflections on her period, uh, a previous period spent as a visiting scholar in this country. 
Hers is a singular voice amongst discrimination lawyers, and her contribution to our understanding of EU law generally was reflected in her appointment in 2022 to the main chair of EU law at the University of Oxford, the appropriately named Jacques Delors Chair. She's also the founder and leader of several initiatives to promote and support scholars of color, including the Black Female Professors Forum. As commentators, we have three distinguished uh, speakers who each in their own right could have commanded the audience this evening. So we're particularly honored and pleased that Awet Tesfe Isis could join us, the first black woman to win a seat in the Bundestag. She was elected in September 2021, a member of the Green Party. She previously worked as an asylum lawyer representing asylum seekers and refugees. She had previously been a member of Castle City Council since 2016, and even in that context, introduced key pioneering anti-discrimination legislation to deal with discrimination in the context of private rented properties. Her decision to enter national politics was prompted by the racist attacks in Hanno of February 2020. She's currently chair of the Cultural Committee, where she works on decolonization and enhancing diversity, and a member of the legal committee where she works on uh, enhancing the effectiveness of anti-discrimination law. Our second commentator will be Dr. Elizabeth Caneza, who is a legal and political scholar, who wrote a doctoral thesis at the University of Potsdam on the right of black, black, rights of black people in Germany. She is currently the community outreach officer at DASM, the German Center for Integration and Migration Research, which has done pioneering and frankly shocking research on the degree of racism in Germany. Uh, she's currently also been appointed by the German government to the advisory board for the implementation of the UN Decade for People of African Descent. Uh, and finally, but by no means least, our dear colleague, Professor Mark Dawson, who is Professor of European Law and Governance at the Hertie School. He's a leading scholar on EU law and governance, and his many books include the governance of EU fundamental rights. Uh, so Professor Solanka has agreed to speak to us on this uh, vital topic, centering black women in EU equality law. And we'll have the three comments from the podium after that, and then we'll invite, invite you to join us for a Q&A session. So Iliola, the warmest welcome back to Berlin. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for, for coming out and sitting in this hall in what is a beautiful Berlin afternoon. And my thanks also to Civica for uh, enabling me to come here and to the Jacques Delors Centre at the Hertie School and, of course, the Centre for Fundamental Rights and my two kind interviewers for, for your kind comments on introducing me and also my discussants, the discussants for taking time out of your busy schedules to um, not only read my paper but also engage with the um, ideas therein. So it really is a pleasure to be back in Berlin. Um, I was here, as was said, uh, over 20 years ago now as a, a Hearty scholar, as part of the Berliner Colleague. Um, and it's, I think the, the Hearty School was just being set up when I left, so it's, it's very nice to come back you know, 20 years later and see how well, how well it's doing. And of course, to be invited to give this very prestigious um, lecture here today. So as has been said, my topic is uh, centering black women in EU anti-discrimination law. Uh, and I should begin by clarifying, of course, that whilst um, my, my title stresses a focus on black women, um, I, I believe and I hope that by centering black women in EU anti-discrimination law, of course, the benefits will be broader than uh, just this group. So just as slopes have been uh, added to buildings to make them more accessible for those who use wheelchairs or have mobility scooters, um, I hope that by centering black women, um, this will improve the vision and the impact of anti-discrimination law uh, to make it more effective in securing substantive uh, equality. So black women are my starting point, but by no means the only or end point for anti-discrimination law. And I think what I'm really trying to encourage us to do is to shift um, our, our understanding of discrimination and, as I said, our vision for anti-discrimination law 
from what traditionally we, we speak of the Aristotelian idea of equality to um, the vision of equality of a, a black woman such as Sojourner Truth, who was a, a, a former slave in the United States. So this is an overview of my talk. I'll uh, set my timer for 35 minutes. I've probably already used five. Um, but I'll say a little bit about what I see as the difference between intersectionality, multiple discrimination, and intersectional discrimination. Um, I think it's, uh, it's a troubling that this, this, this difference has really been um, eroded. Um, over the years, um, and I'll, I'll explain why I think that has happened um, when I talk about the marginali marginalization of the voice of black women. And I'll end by um, what I call, if we think of the, the 1989, 1989 seminal article by uh, Professor Crenshaw as uh, Demarginalizing Black Women 1.0 then what I will suggest is a demarginalizing black women 2.0 because my, um, my understanding of intersectional discrimination as it is understood as, as present in, in, in Europe has contributed to uh, actually a remarginalization of black women rather than a demarginalization. So, okay, if I start by going um, back to basics and defining what I mean by intersectional discrimination, which, as I said, I think of as distinct to intersectionality as well as to multiple discrimination. So, as I said, if I think, I think if these terms are conflated, it can lead to a confusion. Um, and this confusion can actually undermine our goals in seeking to ensure protection for uh, uh, black women and other intersectional forms of discrimination in law. So if I start with uh, intersectionality, which I haven't put up there, because I think intersectionality has become this kind of general term which we use um, across all fields to think about um, examination of any type of um, relationship at the nexus. So, for example, we find intersectional, intersectionality is used in, in the climate field, um, it's used in medicine, it's used in political science. It's not uh, a form, a term that is linked to law at all. It just generally denotes uh, a perspective that is about looking at the, the nexus, looking at what happens when there are two disciplines, two sectors, to um, any two of anything or three of anything really that might come together. So it's just this general phrase of understanding um, what happens at the borders um, of, of various groups. So for example, the EU gender equality strategy of 2020 talks about intersectionality as a horizontal principle for its implementation. Multiple discrimination um, is somewhat different. Multiple discrimination is generally just used in law and it refers to pluralist approaches in law. So we can speak about additive multiple discrimination which is when one person can experience race discrimination and then gender discrimination uh, at the same time. But in order to prove that case, the individual will have to prove that there has been race discrimination and then separately prove that there has been gender discrimination. Um, and it's called additive because the two separate forms of discrimination take place at the same time to the same person. In contrast to that is cumulative multiple discrimination, which can also happen to the same person, but they happen at different times. So in the Al Jumad case, um, he first of all experienced race discrimination, and then a few months later there was discrimination on the grounds of religion, and then a few months after that he experienced discrimination on the grounds of disability. So it was cumulative because um, the, the discrimination happened to the same person, but at different points in time. Again, in order to prove um, his case, he would have to uh, provide evidence to support a claim of race discrimination and a case of religion discrimination, and then a case of uh, disability discrimination. So these multiple discrimination really refers to an aggregation of the experience of discrimination. 
which is quite different to the idea of synergy, which is inherent in intersectional discrimination. Now, European Union uh, equality law does recognise multiple discrimination. So both the race directive of 2000 and, uh, of 2000 and the equal, equal employment directive of 2000 in their preamble do both explicitly call for recognition of multiple discrimination as a facet of gender. So there is um, already recognition of multiple discrimination in European Union law. And there has even been a case before the Court of Justice, uh, the case of, of ODAR, which uh, concerned disability discrimination and age discrimination. And in that case, the court found disability discrimination, but no age discrimination in relation to the German national rules on uh, calculating occupational social security. However, multiple discrimination has not in any way changed the way in which anti-discrimination law um, sees. So it just means that anti-discrimination anti law can see more types of discrimination, but it's not seeing the, the synergistic type of discrimination that is inherent in intersectional discrimination. Intersectional discrimination, by contrast, highlights aspects which are co-determined and also interdependent, so that the elements work together to make something new. So just as in this um, graphic here, you can see that when you put red and yellow together, and we'll all know this from our basic chemistry lessons, when you put red and yellow together, you make orange. And that is the, the idea behind intersectional discrimination, that when you have um, uh, certain characteristics that interact, then something anew, there is a new quality of the discrimination that arises. And this was the, the, the thing I think that Professor Crenshaw was highlighting in her article. Um, it's an idea that um, didn't arise from theory. Um, you will know about the case of de Graffenried and the cases of Jeffries, where there were individuals who were experiencing discrimination but were unable to bring a case because um, they wouldn't have, uh, there were white women employed by General Motors, so a sex discrimination case would have been unsuccessful. And there were also black men hired by General Motors, so a race discrimination claim would have been unsuccessful. But there was very clearly um, an experience of discrimination, which meant that even though black women made up something like 20% of the labor force in St. Louis at that time in the 70s, um, the, 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 the percentage of black women in General Motors went from one to uh, zero, because these women had been the last to be hired because of their race and gender. And at that time, there was the, the last in first out principle. So when there was an economic downturn, they were also the first to be fired. And they wanted to argue that this was because of their specific um, uh, uh, identity as black women and their specific place in the American uh, labor market um, uh, coming through slavery and then uh, Jim Crow. So this was the, the, the experience of discrimination that the concept of intersectional discrimination wanted to um, encapsulate. That it's not race or gender, but it's race and gender put together. Um, it was a, a concept that was set within critical race feminism, and it tried to es establish race and gender discrimination in its historical, social, and political context to highlight not only the experiences of these black women, but also the context of white patriarchal employment practices and highlight the lack of a remedy for this experience of discrimination. So fundamentally, the concept um, uh, stressed that in such situations, race and gender couldn't be separated. So very different to multiple discrimination. Um, as such, in bringing cases to court, this would mean that uh, the claimant would not have to bring a case separately or would not have to prove separately race discrimination 
and then, then, then gender discrimination, but would be able to be recognised as a black woman as such. And there, there is a case from the, the United Kingdom, the Hewitt case, where the court did recognise uh, this uh, intersectional, this experience of intersectional discrimination and allowed the complainant, complainant to use a white man as the comparator. So I wanted to share with you a particular case, and I promise you there will not be as much text on any more of my slides, but this is quite a, 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 an in, important case, I think, in understanding the way in which intersectional discrimination works. And it was a case from Canada, which concerns uh, a young woman, a young black woman, who suffered uh, long-term and, and dreadful sexual harassment by her employer. Um, he would turn up at her house, he would undress in front of her, he would invite her to strip clubs, he would show her images on his computer of, of black women dancing in a half-naked state, um, all because he had a certain conception of a black woman. And I just wanted to, 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 to share these paragraphs because I think it sets out quite nicely how to approach a case of intersectional discrimination. So the judge said that the findings of the case were of sufficient gravity to have been successful actually as a single ground case of discrimination uh, on either sex or race, or indeed even a case of multiple discrimination. Um, however, the judge stressed that she wanted the law to acknowledge that Bayliss Flannery was not a woman who happens to be black or a black person who happens to be female, but a black woman. And then the, the judge sets out the dangers in adopting a single ground uh, approach is that it could be characterized as a sexual harassment matter that involved a black complainant, thus negating the importance of the racial discrimination that she suffered as a black woman. And in terms of the impact on her psyche, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. The impact of uh, these highly discriminat discriminatory acts on her personhood is serious. So the tribunal finds that the forms of discrimination were intersectional in nature. The respondent, as her employer, sexually solicited her, sexually harassed her, racially harassed her, engaged in discriminatory treatment towards her within employment, poisoned her workplace with pornography that mirrored both her race and gender, and he did so because she was an attractive young black woman and all the evidence heard about his views about blacks and Africans, his comments about dating, his visits to strip clubs, his fixation with, um, with Melina, who was an, another young woman, uh, the black female escort he found on the internet, and his hiring practices indicate he had a stereotypical view of attractive young black women over whom he can assert economic, and, uh, economic power and control. So the judge decided to use an intersectional approach because this highlighted the socio and economic power and control within which this harassment, racial and sexual harassment, was, was set. And I think this is one of the key aspects which differentiates intersectional discrimination from multiple discrimination. It's intersectional discrimination tries to highlight the structural embeddedness of discrimination and the difference that this can make to the material experience of discrimination. So it's, this is its unique com contribution, if you like, to understanding discrimination law. It tries to highlight the, the social power, the social context, which underpins and sustains discrimination. And that is, I think, its, its key purpose. Now, where does it derive this purpose? I think it derives this purpose from the uh, intellectual activity of uh, black women, many of whom were previously enslaved and who did, such as Sojourner Truth or Harriet Tubman, drew attention to these structural inequities. Um, just as non-citizens understand the value of citizenship, the powerless, these enslaved women, understand the contours and consequences of power. So black women had been lynched and raped to give birth to children and of course those children then became products to perpetuate the slave uh, system. Uh, the only way to escape perpetual uh, enslavement was to either die or to flee 
as, as Harriet Tubman indeed did. And it was such women, I think, who survived slavery and who were then able to examine the, the slave economy, the slave plantation economy through their own eyes, uh, created this philosophy of structural inequality, which is the, um, the, the intellectual foundation of intersectional discrimination. Um, so I've just seen I've already been speaking for 20 minutes, so I'm just going to <laughs> move on a little bit. So I don't think I'll uh, go through these cases. We can come back to that if you like. Um, what I'd like to spend my last um, minutes talking about is what we can do to address the, the way in which black women have been decentered from uh, the idea of intersectional uh, discrimination law. But before doing that, of course, it would help to think about how this happened in the first place. And I think part of the problem was uh, the transitions that took place when this, this idea of intersectional discrimination moved from America to uh, Europe and also moved from law because this was a concept initially founded in critical legal theory, moved from law to sociology and to gender studies. And during this ge geographical and disciplinary transition, the concept was transformed to the extent that gender came to overwhelm intersectional discrimination at the expense of race, whereas in its uh, paradigmatic formulation, the uh, opposite was the case because, as I've tried to explain, intersectional discrimination was designed to speak to the unique social, political and economic experiences of black women. So in the European Union, the approach to intersectional discrimination has been very much mediated through the lens of gender, which of course was uh, one of the key starting points for the legal prohibition of discrimination in the European Union. Now this isn't problematic per se, as of course gender is as integral to the idea of intersectional discrimination as race. And it's the synergy between the two that is fundamental to it. What is problematic is that gender overshadows race. And this was perhaps inevitable because, and we just, some of us spoke about this earlier, it is still sadly the case that across mainland Europe, there remains reluctance to take race seriously, even if racism is now recognized by 90% of the population, as recent research from DedSim has, um, has clarified. Um, there is even, as some of you might be aware, uh, uh, discussions in Parliament to remove the word race from the one place where it appears in the Constitution. And it isn't only Germany that is having those conversations. There, there are also conversations uh, along this line in Sweden and in Italy. Now, what this results in, of course, is not a, a, a tackling or a combating or a, um, a removal of racism. Uh, it just silences the problem because it means that we don't have the language to discuss uh, racism. It means that uh, the experiences, black women in particular, become invisible in law and silenced in politics, where race isn't recognized as a meaningful socio-political category. Black women workers will remain marginalized and lack in adequate resources to fight for political voice and legal protection. So without the idea of race, I think intersectional theory is just, just fails to be adequate to the task for which it was created. So how then would we go about recentering black women in intersectional discrimination and in European Union law? So I just suggest that there are five things that we need to do. The first thing that we need to do is to um, restore our understanding of intersectional discrimination and to re-emphasize the value add or the added value that this concept brings us when we're trying to tackle discrimination. Um, and I think that there are two uh, specific or unique contributions that intersectional discrimination makes. The first is to provide a remedy for discrimination when a remedy would otherwise be withheld. So the de Graffenreid and the Jeffries scenario or the Paris case here in, uh, in the, before the Court of Justice. 
and also to provide a remedy for discrimination when the circumstances are so egregious that an intersectional um, remedy is uh, required, as in the case of Bayless Flannery. Uh, the second uh, thing that I think is necessary is to recognize and reflect upon Eurocentrism in knowledge production. So this is part of the, 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 this is part of the, the, the problem that created these transitions from the United States to Europe and from critical race feminism or critical legal studies in general to gender studies and sociology. Uh, if we deprive ourselves of the language to discuss this issue, then we effectively um, prevent ourselves from tackling the issue. Also, if we don't think about race, um, then we don't think about the need to collect racial data. And if we don't actually know the, the, the nuances and the contours of the experience of racism, then how can we strategically address it? So there is a need to uh, collect racial data. And secondly, if we fail to talk about race, then we also don't think about the racial homogeneity in, throughout our society. So a long time ago, I wrote an article asking where are the, uh, the black professors in Germany. There are thankfully one, at least one, there might be more, but I know there is at least one in the audience. Um, my friend Maisha, Professor Maisha Eggers. Um, but where are the other black professors in Germany, female for the purposes of this lecture, but also uh, in general male? Where are the uh, black female lawyers? Where are the black female judges? If we, if we deprive ourselves of, the, of the, the language to ask ourselves this question, then we are also depriving ourselves of the opportunity to uh, create a, a solution. The other thing that I think we need to do is think about the, um, the core concepts that we use to uh, design anti-discrimination uh, law. So historically, um, we have designed anti-discrimination laws to tackle specific types of discrimination. So race discrimination or sex discrimination, religion discrimination on grounds of religion or age discrimination, etc. And these have all been seen as mutually exclusive. So as in uh, the, the case of multiple discrimination, uh, when you are bringing a case which, has, which covers multiple grounds of discrimination, this is why you have to uh, provide proof to every single ground separately, because that's the way that the law has designed the protection. Now, one question is, we should ask ourselves is why these, uh, why these personal attributes and not others? Uh, in the United Kingdom and uh, to a large extent also in the United States, the reason why uh, these biological features have been protected rather than others is because they were seen as immutable. They were seen as attributes that individuals didn't choose and over which we have little or no control. Okay, so um, scientific evolution has meant that that isn't now always the case, but nonetheless, uh, anti-discrimination anti law generally focuses on those attributes that cannot be changed and that individuals have not chosen for themselves and which per se evoke uh, a negative public response. However, this design per se is, uh, is, is, uh, forces us to approach discrimination from one ground to the other. So it will always be additive or cumulative because we start, uh, we start our design of anti-discrimination law from this idea of immutability. So one thing that I've written about in the, the book that was mentioned earlier, Discrimination of Stigma, is to uh, rethink the, the logic underpinning anti-discrimination law. So why do we have to use immutability as, if you like, our, our guide to determining when an attribute should be protected by discrimination law? If you think about something such as weight, there's huge amounts of discrimination um, of those who are of a larger body size or fat, if you're part of the fat activist um, movement, but there are very few places in the world that actually prohibit, legally prohibit discrimination on the grounds of weight. And that's because, for the most part, people uh, uh, think that if you are fat or if you are heavier or if you are living with obesity, 
it's because you eat too much and do not exercise enough. So it isn't seen as an immutable problem. It's seen as one that people have control over and that they can change. So that's, I think, one reason why there is such pervasive weight discrimination in society, because um, society, and that's reflected in the law, sees this as something that the individual, over which the individual has control. The other challenge of uh, this kind of silo uh, design of anti-discrimination law is that it doesn't accommodate synergy. So as I said, you're, you're always having to, to add. So one... Uh, possibility is to identify an alternative logic for the design of discrimination law. And this is what I wrote about in the book Discrimination of Stigma. Um, so I suggest that instead of immutability as the logic for design and anti-discrimination law, we use the idea of stigma. And a stigma which um, we understand from the groundbreaking work of Irving Goffman from 1963, uh, a stigma is something, it can be a status, it can be a mark, it can be um, a physical um, attribute that discredits the individual. Uh, it's, a, it's a mark that is negative and that can be used as a reason to uh, punish those who, who uh, uh, possess um, this stigma. It's also something that is seen as inescapable and it's something that the individual has no control over. Now, when Irving Goffman wrote about stigma, he focused very much on the face-to-face -face element. So what happens when an individual with a stigma meets an individual who is not bearing this stigma? Uh, and what happens in that face-to-face -face interaction? More recently, um, social uh, psychologist studies of stigma have, uh, uh, have presented stigma as more of a process. So stigma is um, described as a process of disempowerment, which is very much driven by social power. Now, of course, some stigmas, and you can see on the, the far left-hand side there, the stages of disempowerment, which begin with labeling and then uh, end with discrimination after the label has caused the person to lose their social status. So these are stages um, which um, uh, uh, an individual goes through in order to be in a position whereby they are seen as so worthless in society that they can then be um, a, a victim of discrimination. And as Lincoln Phelan says, stigma is entirely dependent on social, economic and political power because it takes power to stigmatise. So my argument is then that if we use this idea of stigma, this shifts our, our focus from the attribute, per se, to the meaning that is given to the attribute. Uh, and it's the meaning that is given to the attribute that should be the target of anti-discrimination law. So I, I, I created what, what I think of as the anti-stigma principle, which should be used not in deciding cases of discrimination, but in the design of anti-discrimination law. Because what that allows us then to do is think about the different ways in which stigmas uh, exist and the different ways in which stigmas operate. So it can be that a single attribute causes a stigma, such as race. Or it can be that two or three attributes cause a stigma, such as race and gender. So if we start with the idea of stigma, we uh, inherently have a, um, a principle that is capable of incorporating that synergy, which I think of as being uh, fundamental to uh, intersectional discrimination. Clearly not all stigma leads to discrimination, but I think that by uh, focusing, uh, by thinking about discrimination as stigma, we disrupt the existing categories uh, as we now have them so that we're no longer thinking about these attributes in a biological sense, but we're thinking about them in a socio-economic and, and political sense uh, as the, the way in which these attributes work to strip away the right to equal reg regard. Um, I think that this would also be a very useful way for the European Union to go about creating anti-discrimination law because it also provides a flexibility for the different member states 
to design, it provides a framework within which individual member states can then identify for themselves the stigmas that are most prevalent within their communities that need to be um, uh, um, outlawed or prohibited by law. And what I do in the book is identify 10 different questions that legislators can ask themselves to decide whether an attribute or a group of attributes are um, um, stigmatized in a way that they should be protected in law. Um, so the, the, you can see the, the questions um, there, whether the mark is arbitrary, whether it has some meaning in, in and of itself, uh, all the way down to the impact of this uh, mark. Do the targets suffer discrimination? Do they suffer exclusion? And is access to key resources blocked? So this, I think, would help us, if we thought about discrimination this way, would help us to re-centre re uh, black women in uh, EU equality law. And then finally, I think we need to then think about how we position anti-discrimination law. Um, and I think it might help us if we take a broader approach to anti-discrimination law or anti-discrimination law as not just being about individuals um, seeking justice for themselves in courts, which is a very um, draining and expensive thing for any individual to take on themselves. And in England, at least, cases of, of race discrimination are the hardest to be brought and the ones that are least likely to be won. But if we think about discrimination as a public health issue, or if we think about discrimination as a virus, then actually what we are doing when we are tackling discrimination is not relying so much on the law and on individual capacity to bring a, a, a legal case, but we're thinking about uh, what society as a whole can do to tackle discrimination. And of course, we've all just been through the, the horrors of uh, COVID-19, uh, before COVID-19, there was Zika. Before Zika, there was Ebola. And if you look at the way in which public health specialists tackle viruses, then they take a much uh, broader approach to, to trying to control the, the outbreaks. There's very much a sense in which there is a, an individual and a social responsibility to tackling a virus. So it's not just about the individual who experiences discrimination, but there's also a social responsibility to, to combat this virus. And of course, we all know what we had to go through in order to um, contain and, and defeat the, the uh, coronavirus um, pandemic. Which means then that tackling a virus is everybody's business. So it's not just um, the individual or their family that has, to, has a responsibility to tackle discrimination, but everybody, even those who aren't affected directly, have this responsibility. It also means that tackling discrimination becomes a multi-level uh, activity. So it's not just a, a question of um, uh, an individual or an, a single institution, but it's, it's a, a shared responsibility across institutions at the national level, at the local level, at the regional level, and at the in international level. So again, as we saw with coronavirus, there was a, a high amount of cooperation and coordination between the United Nations and national governments and, and local authorities, etc. cetera. Um, and if we, if we do take that perspective, then the idea of positive action or affirmative action which currently we all think of as some kind of anomaly and we're not really comfortable about using positive action, that becomes the norm rather than the exception to tackling discrimination. So when I talk about discrimination as a virus, I'm not trying to medicalize discrimination, but I'm trying to move our thinking uh, to a, a public health sphere, which gives us a much broader understanding of what the problem is and gives us a much broader or a, perhaps a more... Uh, a more determined um, uh, uh, attitude towards tackling it. So um, I've got one minute left, so I'll just conclude. Um, I think that intersectional discrimination remains an important and a useful concept. Um, I think that uh, uh, identification of a remedy for intersectional discrimination remains necessary across Europe. 
Um, I don't think, sadly, that the, even though we talk about intersectional discrimination in the European Union, I don't think we yet address the blind spot that was articulated by Professor Cremshaw in 1989. And I think that centering black women requires a range of actions, which, as I've said, includes recognition of race, um, intersectional discrimination that is devoid of race and also devoid of synergy will only remarginalize black women workers in Europe. So the actions to recenter black women in EU equality law will, as I said at the outset, not only uh, benefit black women. Wider benefits oops, will be felt by other people, um, by other groups who find themselves in a situation where they don't have a legal remedy to tackle discrimination. So I've uh, suggested that the idea of the anti-stigma principle offers a method to consider whether other attributes, such as weight, should also be protected by anti-discrimination law. And finally, if we adopt this public health um, approach, it will provide us with a broader scope to take joined up actions to tackle all forms of discrimination in, under the, the rubric of EU equality law. Thank you very much. So much, Iliola. Um, I'll invite our commentators to the stage also and let you catch your breath also. Um, but thank you for that tour de force and I'm so grateful for the way you integrated your ideas from the book and, and also these observations. Um, it did strike me that, uh, I mean, any time in Berlin when somebody mentions 1989, it was such a momentous year, but I've always found it intriguing that this very legalistic concept has now become you know, an everyday buzzword in conversation, and yet somehow we've lost the, the legal teeth that it was meant to have. So thank you so much for, for highlighting that point uh, so clearly in your lecture. Um, so our first respondent is Awed, so I'd like to hand over directly to you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Just, just speak and it picks it up. Ah, okay. yeah. yeah, thank you very much. It was uh, a really... Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Okay, ah, oh, now it's working. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your speech. Uh, I took a lot of notes and also took a lot of pictures with my mobile and uh, I think I'll have a lot to think about still when uh, I'm at home this evening uh, because, of course, you, you were also talking to the lawmakers and that's uh, also me. So, yeah, I would a little bit... Uh, like to talk about the concept of race mm -hmm. and the problematic here in Germany we, which we have um, uh, with this word. Um, I happen to be in the legal committee mm -hmm. and responsible for this part, what to do with this word in our constitution. Um, I think, as you might know, race and Rasse in German, have a quite different uh, context. Like, you know, in, in, for example, in the US, um, most of the people um, see themselves in a category, category of race, identify themselves as, for instance, black people. Um, in Germany, we have two differences, uh, in my opinion. First of all, the word. The word is in context with the uh, Second World War, with the colonial period, with the uh, German scientists going to Africa, measuring noses, scalps, and identifying by biological reasons why people are this way and the other way. And the word, right, we just said earlier today, people till, till today believe there are different races in this world. In Germany, people believe it. And that was what I was taught at school to in my books. I had in my uh, geography book uh, pictures of different races. And uh, this why we, that's why we have a problem with this word, because it was seen for a long time as a biological word, and it's 
we're fighting against people thinking till today that I am from a different race than somebody else. So that's one thing which is uh, the problem. And the other thing is I think traditionally people who are in Germany, uh, not all of them identify so clearly in this uh, race categories because um, this is mainly people who are very um, in a political field or politicized. Um, a lot of people identify more with their heritage, actually. It takes some time. A lot of people identify like, you know, I'm Turkish, I'm, I'm African, I'm Eritrean, I'm American, whatever. And it takes time to understand why we identify this way. For me, myself, I, long time, I had the German passport, but I didn't say I'm German. I always said I'm Eritrean. And then I started to understand the racism behind it and that I'm accepting this racism and how come I'm not identifying as a German, as a black German. And only after you go to this process, you start identifying um, as black, for example, and as a black German. And so um, the word race is not in the same posi position as the English word. So um, we, use of, we use a lot of other words like uh, migrantisierte Person, Migrationsgeschichte, whatever. And I ask myself, what is the appropriate word for us here in Germany? And um, I see that we look to discussions happening in the US and um, I feel like we have to have our own identity, our own words, but we don't have um, we don't have uh, like black studies or something here. We don't have scientists. You said, where are, where are the black professors? We have too little of it to find our own words. So that is our, one of our main problems. I think I would just concentrate on that part. Thank you so much, Joette. Uh, Elizabeth? Yes, thank you very much. First of all, um, Professor Solanke for your lecture and which was very thought-provoking. Um, yeah, and also inspires me. Thank you very much. I wish to begin my commentary by highlighting the influence of your research for my own journey as a legal scholar. When I first read your contribution in the anthology Kritische Weißleinsforschung in Deutschland, Mythen, Subjekte, Masken, um, with the title, Where are the black lawyers in Germany? I had just started working on my dissertation at the law faculty of the University of Potsdam. I was a black doctorate candidate doing research on the racial discrimination faced by black people in Germany. Um, and thanks to your text, I started seeing myself as a relevant factor for my research, not just because I was the one researching, but because I am a researcher who could position herself as black woman and because I was in an academic field that clearly lacked the perspective of black scholarship. So thank you very much for this contribution. <laughs> I would like to state that in my view, commenting now on your lecture, we are standing at the very beginning of a development. So for me, it's not so much a question of whether we can center uh, black women in EU anti-discrimination law, it's also actually a question if we can create their visibility, if we can place them in law at all. And the experience of marginalization. We first have to implement intersectional discrimination by having a racial referent next to gender. And also, thank you, Owet, for your comment. And I wish to say that whenever I speak about race or race in German, I do it as a legal category and as a legal uh, prohibited ground of discrimination. And as Kimberly Crenshaw put it, 
As far as black women are concerned, it is not more inclusive to just acknowledge gender. And I quote her, for white women claiming sex discrimination is simply a statement that but for gender, they would not have been disadvantaged. For them, there is no need to specify discrimination as white females because their race does not contribute to the disadvantage for which they seek redress. And this view, she continues, is derived from this grounding. So it takes race privilege as a given. And thus discrimination against white females is the standard sex discrimination claim. So however, as you have also shown, the category of race is not a dominant category in mainland Europe, but gender is. And I also think it's problematic that it overshadows race. And interestingly, although race has been incorporated in many national constitutions in Europe, especially in the aftermath of the Second World War, it has had little effect on the acknowledgement of racial disparities within societies. And while the reason for recognizing race as a prohibited ground of discrimination in Europe goes back to the experience of structural discrimination and persecution of racial minorities, race became some kind of a dominant category. One can get the impression that it's there to fulfill the role of a commitment to never again, but also it fulfills the role as a reassurance that racial discrimination is prohibited and that because of that, it cannot occur. In addition then to adding a racial dimension to sex discrimination, it is important to take into consideration the history and position of black women, including socioeconomic status and power structures. Many black women work under precarious and discriminatory work conditions, and they do so in order to survive and to support their families. However, the realities remain invisible in many cases. The knowledge about how black women were treated under the periods of enslavement, colonialism and Nazi Germany, and about the rise of black feminism in Germany is paramount to understand the inequality they face, especially here in Germany. In the book, Farbe Bekennen, Afro-Deutsche Frauen auf den Spuren ihrer Geschichte, Maya Yim, Katharina Guntoye and Dagmar Schulz provided a collection of stories of black German women and gave a historical account of both their discrimination, but also their emancipation and movement. In Europe, social movements have played a decisive role for the development of anti-racial discrimination, and I now turn to EU law. The EU Equality Directive goes back to Article 13 of the Treaty Establishing the European Community. And I don't know if many of you know it, but we have this legal basis due to the pressure of civil society and minority groups. And this created actually the beginning of now what we know as the AU race directive, and which was implemented in Germany through what we call the Allgemeine Gleichbehandlungsgesetz. And I wish to conclude by saying that in law, it's important how you phrase a question when you want to examine a legal situation. If we would ask whether women who are black are protected against discrimination, I think this question with the legal framework we have could be answered with yes. If we would then ask if black people who identify themselves as women are protected against discrimination, this question we could also answer with yes. But, if we were to ask if black women as a subject are protected against intersectional discrimination, I'm afraid, I think the answer will be not yet. The social concept of race is not widely understood and recognized. And there is a lack of historical consciousness. Consciousness for a history that includes the impact of the trade of enslaved Africans, colonialism, and national socialism on European societies, and how these systems have caused disparities between racial groups and the marginalization of black women in the past and present. And this is why I state again, 
we are at the very beginning towards implementing intersectional discrimination and for this we need to create visibility for black women in EU and national law. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I think that's such a powerful reminder, actually, that this EU directive uh, was really a surprise. I mean, race was also marginalized in EU law for so long, and when there was this legal base created, it wasn't at all self-evident it would ever be translated into legislation. And as you said, that was real a civil society move, but in the year 2000. So we're still <laughs> really talking about quite a long time ago. So it seems appropriate then to invite our EU governance and policy expert, Mark, to reflect on uh, the EU dynamics that are at work here. Mark. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Catherine. And thank you, Yola, Professor Zelanka, for this really great uh, lecture on recentering black women in equality law. And I feel sort of looking at your wider work, it's also scholarship on sort of recentering EU law as a discipline, actually changing the types of questions we ask in EU law. So when I was first uh, drawn to the, to the subject, I think EU law was a very formalistic uh, discipline, a very doctrinal discipline. I think most of the people who did it were sort of the true believers, you know, they believed in European integration. But of course, what that hid actually was the substantive questions that underlay EU law, the extent to which EU law is actually forwarding social justice or actually restricting social justice. So I feel like sort of your work is actually pushing forward a new set of questions about EU law that have been the background for too long about who wins and who loses um, in the discipline of EU law. I wanted to make two uh, comments. Really, they're more sort of um, questions, uh, sort of listening to your to your lecture, and they're very much from the perspective of a, of a generalist EU lawyer. Um, and one is sort of maybe the conflict between a centralized versus a decentralized approach to EU equality law. And I think you spoke to this actually quite a bit in your, in your talk. Um, so of course, that's a conflict we see in EU law more generally, sort of when should the EU define a policy in a, a centralized way across different member states? And when should it defer to the member states? And of course, in your talk, you made a, you also made a very strong pitch for a decentralized approach to an extent, which you said, well, if we adopt a stigma-based approach to equality, that allows us to respect the fact that the way stigma is experienced might be different in different member states. Um, so once um, Fritz Sharp, for example, he talked about legitimate diversity, right? There's just, there's, there's different, ways of dealing with uh, discrimination, equality, and different experiences of discrimination between different member states. There is, though, I think, also another view of EU equality law, which, again, is embedded in the history of EU equality law, which is that you, you seek a remedy through the EU actually because you're suspicious of this decentralized approach. Right? You think that the national system actually hasn't worked, that the national system has blind spots, um, that actually it's better to be disembedded actually and to appeal to a common European set of rights that we define commonly. Um, so when we think about the really foundational cases of equality law like the Fren or even the cases surrounding sexual orientation, I think it was about that. It was about appealing to some sort of common EU definition set of rights. Um, so I want, so that's sort of a first tension I wanted to ask you about sort of how decentralized should we be um, or how centralized should we be? And actually maybe having a, a sort of a common approach to how we define equality and how we recenter black women might be part of identity building in Europe and part of sort of taking rights seriously in the European context. The second um, question I had, which is referring to a slightly different tension, is more about the way forward. And it's a, a bit of a question about sort of how radical your approach is actually. So it has a lot of really radical implications and surely involve lots of changes to EU quality law. Um, but there are also some more traditional aspects of it. So one, for example, is the idea of a comparator. So you absolutely want to redefine how we look for a comparator, but you're, you're still looking for a comparator, right? Still trying to, and other anti-discrimination lawyers, they argue that that itself is a problem, that sort of just by taking a situation of discrimination and seeing it through the lens of two 
individuals, um, that that ignores sort of the substantive inequalities that sort of create that situation. Um, so that sort of leads me to the question of, to what extent should our approach to recentering black women, should it be incremental? So is it more a case of, for example, persuading the Court of Justice that the, this idea of protected characteristics is wrong and that what underlies this idea of protected characteristics is actually an idea of stigma and that's a more sustainable idea? Or actually, would that be not enough? So even if we adopted this stigma-based approach, but at the same time tied it to other things, like the need to look for a comparator, that that would pose a sort of a very difficult hurdle, actually, for the types of litigants that you want to protect and you want to see represented in EU law. So maybe we, we actually need something much more radical, which is going back to the race directive and altering the race directive, which, when I look around, would be something really challenging, but would, 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 in, would invite sort of more, maybe capture more what you aim to do with your, with your project. So um, these are two slightly more you know, pessimistic remarks about the future maybe, but um, they were stimulated by this really, really interesting, not just lecture, but wider scholarship. So thank you very much. So thank you to the three commentators for those uh, very succinct, but also very insightful comments from very different perspectives. So Inyora, if you want to choose what to respond to, because uh, it's an invitation to give a second lecture, but... Uh, <laughs> Do that. But I would like to just respond briefly to each of them because, as you said, they were all so different and also very interesting. So thank you all for um, sharing these ideas, which will help me to um, develop, of course, the work. And um, it's so fascinating to note you sit on this legal committee that is considering the removal of the word rasse. That must be a very, very difficult um, task indeed um, but you know you you said who identifies as black well we have somebody sitting next to you who identifies as black but i agree with you that is um it, it is a process um and it's a process that we also uh, went through in the united kingdom when we de were developing the law so this this isn't you know there isn't any kind of prescription um but um it remains the case that removing a word which is um, powerfully defines the experiences of a group of people is unhelpful when trying to um, redress or provide some kind of redress for those experiences. Um, and there are already aspects in, in Germany where um, race is recognized. So if you look at data collected for, for, uh, uh, in the area of criminal law, race is used there. So it's really, there seems to be a kind of um, uh, a choice being made, which isn't necessarily um, to, in the best interests of those who are suffering from discrimination. Um, so removing the word is not going to um, change uh, the experiences or um, uh, improve the, the practices. That, that's how I think about um, the, the, the issue. Uh, and the question of the context, Yes, um, the context is, is different, but you know, as you said, Germany had a history of colonialism, uh, just as the other European countries had. It's just not spoken about. So the more we understand the, 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 the process of racialization in Germany, the less um, anomalous it will be to have the word race in the constitution, because then people will start to understand why it's there beyond the Second World War experience. Um, it actually speaks to something that came before the Second World War experience. And that's, that's a, an educational piece that needs to, to take place, I think. Um, and in relation to, to the labels, we have this discussion in England too. So we, we use the, the government phrase is black, Asian and minority ethnic. And there is, there is a lot of discussion as to whether that's an appropriate phrase to use. Okay, um, Elizabeth, well, thank you so much for, for letting me know how important that piece was um, for you. It was a, a, a short piece I wrote just before I left Germany 20 years ago. And again, I want to shout out to Professor Maisha, who is in the audience, who was actually one of the editors of that book and approached me to, um, to, to write that piece, which then went on to also appear in the, the second edition. So it's, and you know, it's, it's things like that that make the difference. So the fact that 
my issue was there doing this work that I happened to be around doing my work that you then went to Potsdam to do your work. It's those kinds of connections that we need to bring together so you know, the, the, the work grows and, and, and develops. Um, the idea of the, the social movements that were important, I, I completely agree with you. Um, and that's, that's what actually brought me into EU law in the first place because I, I worked for an NGO that was part of that movement to have the, the, the amendment to the Treaty of Rome to include the prohibition of racial discrimination. So that's where my interaction with law comes from. It comes very much from um, a social activist um, perspective. Um, and um, yes, I agree with you that the working conditions of black women remain the most precarious, even though there are now more precarious groups. But if we look at what's happened since um, the return to normal after coronavirus, it is very much um, black women, women of color, who have continued to experience the most precarious working conditions. And Mark, thank you very much for your, um, your questions. Uh, I don't know that I see myself, I think I see myself more as trying to, to bridge this tension between centralised and decentralised. I do very much think that there has to be, as you say, uh, a centralised common notion of discrimination in the European Union. Um, but then there, there does have to be, I mean, you know, because member states will demand this, there has to be some form of uh, some space left for some national regulatory autonomy. But I do think very much that the, if you like, the essential elements have to be set down in, in European Union law. Um, and do we need a comparator? So as I was looking through my slides this afternoon, I did stop at that part again, and I looked at the comparator um, discussion that I didn't actually go through, and I thought, not sure that this is right actually so I question myself as well as to whether there is a need to retain the comparator uh, and I think uh, I'll probably go in the direction of those that say we shouldn't need the comparator anymore because the experience of stigmatization should be enough before the court and the, the idea of the comparator does pull us back to um, if you like yeah um, 20th century notions of how anti-discrimination law should work, whereas, um, yeah, I do want us to go forward. So thank you for that. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Iola. Now we have time if you have any questions. Um, it would be great if you could uh, introduce yourselves, and if the question is for our lecturer or any of the respondents, please do let us know. We have a roving mic that will uh, go around. And if those of you who are watching online uh, also want, you can possibly uh, type some questions or indicate if you have questions to ask. Um, okay, I, I'll start at this side of the room, so, and then work across. So I, I saw three hands there, so we might gather them together. Thanks. Hi. Uh, I'm not sure this one. Ah, yes. Yeah, Thank on. you. Hi. I'm Helen. I'm an MPP, first year student at Hurdy. Um, Thank you so much to all of you for sharing your expertise and your perspectives with us and taking the time to talk to us. Um, <clears throat> my question kind of goes in the direction of Professor Dawson's, which is sort of, we talked about the role of the word race in the German constitution as in calling out the problem versus what is the scientific meaning of the word. And I wonder if we focus on the idea of stigma rather than individual categories of discrimination, how do we prevent the erasure of calling out the problem, like sort of specifically in the legal context? How do we implement that in a way that doesn't erase the function of calling out the problem when, for example, in uh, legal judgments? And do we just need a change in legal judgments or and how the law is interpreted? Or do we, as you said, need like a whole um, change of the basis we're working with? Thanks. Thanks for that, Helen. And then there were two hands over here. Thank you, Ta. Thanks. Hello, so glad to hear you speak here. My name is Heather Danielle Thompson. I'm an alumna of the university. I graduated in 2021. And uh, while I was here, I founded a student group called SHIELD. We worked on advocating for students of diverse global origin and racial background. And that was at a time when I first came here as an American and brought up issues of race and quite frankly was told I was being a silly American. We don't discuss race in Germany. So I'm so glad to see this has changed, I think, in part thanks to the advocacy that my group did here. I have a few questions, if you allow me to. The first is that I do understand, without being a German citizen, 
that the discussion of race or chasa feels very different in German. But I would challenge a bit the notion that the dehumanization of black people is a uniquely German feature. It is the same in the States. Black people, in other words, such as nigger, have been used to dehumanize black people. And that words are not immutable and that they change based on the power that we give them. So I would truly like to understand why in the German context, the word rasa cannot be adapted to understand not as a biological difference, but as a cultural and, social and societal difference. And maybe you can comment on this so I can understand a bit more. Um, with that question in mind, my second point as an American, and believe me, I'm not a patriot or a nationalist, I don't believe America is best always. <laughs> and in my thesis for Herdy, which by the way you can see on display in the <laughs> forum, <laughs> I worked on uh, police action in the United States and we used categorical, da categorical data of race. And in that experience, I grappled for the first time with the limitations of race data, which of course we don't have here in Germany. In the States, we view race as a category. You're black, you're white, you're Asian, maybe Native American, and that's pretty much it. We have Hispanic, which can cross over those lines as an ethnicity. And this does tend to leave out people. The most notable are people of Middle Eastern descent who are categorized as white and may face Islamophobia, but then do not have the recourse to really claim this in any data. And of course, other experiences such as myself as a biracial woman who clearly faces different discrimination as people who might have darker skin. And so since that time, I've grappled with this idea of categorical race and that you can see in other cultures more of a, a gradient. And I wonder if we have a third way to deal with race and the collection of it and, and addressing it, maybe a German way, as you said, that we need to think of a new way that need not be American and maybe have some thoughts on this. Right. Thank you, Heather, for those very thoughtful questions. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Sue gonzalez Hauk. I'm a colleague of Elizabeth Kennedy's at Tetsim, working as a legal scholar in the Racism Monitor. Um, and my question kind of connects uh, Elizabeth's comments on visibility with uh, some of the things uh, you mentioned, Professor Salaki, on um, proof and other procedural aspects of discrimination that you were hinting at. And I do think that the problem that we have in Germany right now is that we don't even get to the questions that you're discussing that are about substance of what, how we understand discrimination because only very few cases make it to the courts. Um, and that has something to do with the taboo of uh, race and racism. Uh, courts not wanting to speak about it, um, but it also has a lot to do with yeah procedural limits having to do with the um, um, hierarchies and knowledge uh, production who gets uh, recognized as someone who's speaking from an objective standpoint who has to who gets heard as an expert etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So I would be really interested in hearing more about like an intersectional approach to these procedural aspects. Thank you so much. Those are, I mean, three, four questions, actually. <laughs> so please pick and choose, but okay. there's a lot of richness there, so, too. So. Yeah, thank you all very much for um, those questions. Um, going back to starting with the first one, the idea isn't for stigma to erase the naming, but for stigma to inform the creating of the names. So stigma wouldn't um, deprive us of language. It would just be a different um, uh, principle to create that language. Um, so I, I don't think that it will um, erase the problem, per se. We won't, we won't um, deprive. It's about giving ourselves stronger language to use rather than no language. Um, yeah, why can't Rasa be adapted? It's my question, too. I mean, you know, history tells the story. Um, I would say that the, the reason why it hasn't been adapted is because of the lack of a political will. Um, if we look at the, 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 the trajectory in the United Kingdom, even there, it wasn't until 1991 that we started to collect racial data. So this isn't something that, you know, we've been doing for since way back um, in, the, in the start of time. And even there, there had to be a discussion. But the, the political will was such that if we can't 
identify the contours and the nuances of the problem, then how on earth are we going to be effective in introducing initiatives to tackle it? We'll just be, you know, wasting wasting money, wasting time, just just throwing um, throwing resources to the wind. So I, I completely agree. You races should be adapted rather than uh, removed, and um, perhaps. Um, there could be a, a, a political movement to start to incorporate this new idea of understanding race as a social construct, which is how it is understood in many other parts of the world. Um, and we shouldn't, you know, just down on Germany, because there are other European countries who have the same problem um, with the word race. Um, and I think part of it is, and moving on to the, the, the next question, part of it is the, the lack of education. You know, the, this is such a... Um, this, this problem has so many points of intervention. Um, if in universities, as law students or otherwise, uh, you're not being exposed to critical ways of thinking per se, let alone critical ways of thinking about race, then obviously you don't have that knowledge to take with you into the workplace, whether you're working as a lawyer specifically, or indeed in any other um, sector. So, of course, you would then be more reticent if somebody comes to you and says, oh, I want to take a case of racial discrimination. You'll be like, oh, whoa, you know, we don't talk about race here. This is not what I studied, so I can't have that conversation with you. So the starting point, which was the name of the organisation that actually started the move to, which ended with uh, the Race Equality Directive, the starting point is, is also in education. Um, that doesn't have to be the only area of activity because you, know, you can, you can um, have multiple, as I said at the end, if we think of this as a public, if we take a public health approach, then we can actually take action in multiple, multiple sectors simultaneously. Um, if we then go beyond thinking about the lawyers, another reason why a lawyer would be reticent is they're going to have to persuade a judge about this. And a judge is equally as unlikely to have thought critically about race as the lawyer. So there, is, there are definitely many, um, many points and many moments at which this issue has to be addressed in order for there to be uh, a significant structural change in Germany, but also in other countries uh, across Europe. Yeah, I would just like to um, comment on the second question. Um, let me start a little bit earlier. We are now in a coalition with different parties, and my party, the Green Party, is part of this coalition, who is part of the government. And we have, of course, an agreement on which points we, have, we want to achieve. One of these points is substituting the word Rasse. Uh, so I came now, I'm part of the Bundestag, and this was already decided when I came, so I have to deal with it. Um, in my opinion, it's not really solving any problem, substituting this word, but I don't also believe it's a big problem because it would be substituted with racial discrimination instead of the word Rasse. And I feel the word has a different connotation in Germany. I would never say in German, I am of the Afrikanische Rasse. I wouldn't use it. We use the German, the English word, we use the word race. We, we write a German sentence with an English word because we don't want to use the word Rasse. So that's, that's one point. We, we have a problem with this word. We don't use it. Of course, there are a lot of people who say still, if you keep this word in the Constitution, and don't substitute it, you keep the pain and the memory of this word inside, in, in the Constitution. I understand this argument. But it's not that we're um, taking it out without any substitution, for just eliminating it. Uh, it's uh, substituting it with the word racial discrimination, which I think is also okay. And I can't really tell you, I feel, I feel like Different countries have different discussions. I, I noticed that in, a, in several ways. And when it comes to the world race, I think the discussion in the US, or maybe also in the UK, was different. 
than we had the discussion we had in Germany. We grew up with arguing we are not a race because it's the same word they use for dogs, dog breeds, you know, Hunderasse, it's the same word. So we were fighting our whole life against this word. So it feels it's a problem for a lot of people using this word. So um, that's why it's, you can't compare it. We, we, we don't, re also as black people, we don't use it. We use, we use race, we do that because we understand in, in English context it's different when we don't use Rasse for ourselves. Yeah, maybe if I can add also a perspective on that. Um, first of all, I would like to say that black communities are diverse. Um, we are not homogeneous. There is also black scholarship rising in different fields, especially also in the, in the field of law. And um, we have different perspectives. I have different perspectives as a black person myself, but the more also I dealt and worked, um, of course, um, as a legal scholar. So I would also go your way and say we can adapt Rasse. Even in the US it was adapted. It, was, it didn't start out as something black people always embraced in, in such that they view themselves as race, right? So it's um, just the understanding that there is a social connotation to it. And um, even now in international law, the understanding is when we read race, whatever the legislation, we really take it from a social category. We don't call people as different human races. So I think from a legal perspective, we also need some consensus on that we are dealing with legal text, with legal language, and my common or my minimum point of understanding is in the end we are dealing with a prohibited ground of discrimination which protects people against discrimination. This is the key point. And um, also on the singularity of the German history, which I also don't believe in, you know when, uh, and you know it better, when the EU directive was fought for, member states were not happy about it. They had, they had issues with race across the board. They had an issue with race and they had an issue with racism. So, and when it was finally adapted, when it had to be implemented into national law, we had the same discussion with German politicians. They didn't want to have race. They had an issue with racism. The, di the directive was delayed, the implementation, right? So we also have to ask ourselves, who actually wants to deal with race anyway, <laughs> right? And I have an issue with the substitution because first of all, in the German language, it's not racial discrimination, it's racist discrimination what is going to be changed. And I don't, I'm not very convinced yet about this racism framework top downing <laughs> to, to, the, to the legal framework. Because as also my colleague just said, we have an issue with first understanding what race means in the German context. You also said it, Professor, lawyers don't have, get it, uh, judges don't get it, and now we have the a new framework of racism. What is about substantive equality? What's about positive measures? What's about the comparator, the comparison? Who is, who is recognized as facing racism? Right, so many questions which will add up and so I would also say we can, uh, but I also want to highlight in Germany, it's also a process of we are dialoguing also within communities, but also within scholarship. Right. Do you want to come in? One. Do we have time? Uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> very short. Yeah, just uh, two very small points. Um, one is the sort of, I think, if you look from the perspective of progressive politics more generally, but also the issue of equality, um, I'd be much more positive about what the EU governance framework can achieve than the EU legal framework. I mean, look at another group that we haven't discussed in much detail, which is the Roman Sinti minority in Europe. The number of cases before the Court of Justice 
is minimal, you know, for, for many of the reasons that you mentioned, which is the structural ability to access the courts. So I think the really meaningful changes are the legislative changes, the governance framework that you can put in place that can actually make a meaningful difference to people's lives. But the second issue, of course, is then the central directive, which is the race equality directive. It's, it was progressive at its time, it's very old now. But of course, the issue is sort of, what are the realistic prospects for changing it? So to make the analogy to a field that, that Catherine was much better, the field of asylum, you have, you know, the, the legislative framework is, is defunct in a way, but like an asylum, revisiting it, actually you might end up with an even worse <laughs> framework because there's so much disagreement among the, the member states. And we have the same thing because we have an equality directive, a proposal for an equality directive, extending some of the protections that exist for other grounds of discrimination to areas like services that's been blocked for, for a long time. So I think that would also be unfortunately the fate of changing the racial equality directive. Yeah, I think listening to all of you, it seems like one of the particular features in Germany, and we discussed this earlier, Elizabeth, from the Dietzen research is that there is this stubborn and quite shockingly prevalent belief in biological racism here. And I suppose if this move to remove rasa is understood as a repudiation of biological racism, then that's valuable. But I guess it has to be understood as such, not as something that's a kind of racial aphasia. But at the same time, I find that really shocking because, you know, even, I mean, in CERD, the Convention on the Elimination of Race Discrimination, and in the EU Race Directive, and in every e race discrimination measure I'm familiar with, there is some clear statement saying acknowledging the concept of race is not to endorse biological racism. It's always there. And somehow that's not translated into the German context. And I find that really, really strange, to put it mildly. And maybe this is where the current debate could be helpful, you know, to really frame it in the right way. Yeah. But why is it even necessary? You see? Why does it become necessary in the German context? And even in the EU directive, I read it this, in the preamble where it says, in this directive, the mention of race does not equal to, you know? And we know the history of it. The history was that this was the key question around the discussion table. If we include race, if we include racism, are we not saying there are different races? Don't we want to move beyond this notion that there are different races? And sometimes I believe, really, we also have to talk about the perspectives and positionalities. It's a very wide understanding to say we don't need to talk about race, we don't need to center it, you know? We are beyond it. National socialism is over. Holocaust, we are revisiting it, you know? So, but whenever I see all these statements, also as a scholar, there's stumbling blocks. You read and then you say, ah, there, there was need to clarify what is meant by race. And even now in the German context, there's the idea, maybe we could uh, keep race or rasse, but then, uh, we need um, commentary, we need um, some, some text following, you know, to, to, to clarify. And, but we all have to understand it's really this context of we would feel, and now I speak as a German, we would feel more comfortable if we didn't have to deal with it anymore. But this is not the reality of victims of racial discrimination. And this is a paradox. And it's also a paradox that in German it's legitimate to say Schwarze Frau, Schwarze Mann, Schwarze Organisation, to have the racial referent, but still at the same time to argue against Rasse or racial discrimination as a, as a, as a concept. It's also, we are, we are in this conflict. We want to be seen as black, we have the emancipation as black, but somehow it, it, it's an issue to have racialization as the category and acknowledge it. And Yone, do you want to have the, the final word on the substance? I feel like it should be, <laughs> it should be yours, I think, uh, before I wrap up. Yeah.
think, I think Elizabeth said it very well. I don't know that I could put it any better myself. Um, I've been trying to, to, to remember the name of the author who wrote the book, Race, uh, Racism Without Race, um, bon Bonilla da Silva, Eduardo Bonilla da Silva. You know, he wrote about this 20 years ago. Um, how is this possible? Um, and I, I think I agree with you. You have to think about who is around the table, who, is, who, is, who are the, the dominant uh, groups having this conversation? Who does it benefit? to not speak about race. Um, and if we can have that honest conversation, then perhaps we can start then to uh, address the, the question from a position of honesty and think about why this, this political movement has emerged at all, not just in Germany, but also, as I said, in Italy and Sweden. Great. So thank you all so much. Iliola, thank you for the lecture, but especially thank you also for our respondents and these you know, very uh, timely, insightful and important comments. I think we've been really honored this evening to have this discussion. Um, and I hope this is uh, some contribution to, to the ongoing debate in Germany and at least the opening up. And I'm very glad that uh, the Hurti today is slightly different to the Hurti that you uh, attended. And I hope that the Center for Fundamental Rights with the Jacques Delors Center continue to provide uh, a forum for these kinds of important discussions. So thank you all very much. And thank you also to my colleagues at the center, both centers, but in particular, Dr. Michal Kramer for putting together tonight's event. Uh, these events always run very smoothly, which means there has been a huge amount of work in the background liaising with everybody. So thank you all very much. And we do now have a drinks reception to which you're all invited. So please join us. Thank you. Thank you.